Hello everyone, I'm Lauren Din. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a principal in the investment team at Pollard Capital based in New York. Let me start by thanking you for making the time to join us for our barometer webinar. I am joined today by one of my colleagues, Mike Acri, who is also an investment principal from our New York office. And together we will present the results of our latest barometer. Throughout the session, you will have the opportunity to submit questions. You can do this by using the ask a question button and we will follow up with you with the responses. For those of you who are new to our publication, Caller Capital's Global Private Equity Barometer is a unique snapshot of worldwide trends in private markets. It's a twice a year overview of the plans and opinions of institutional investors based in North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. This 36th edition of the barometer captured the views of 110 private equity investors from around the world. They were surveyed over a period between the 7th of February and 30th of March, 2022. Its findings are globally representative of the LP population by location, type of organization, total AUM, and length of private equity investing experience. The results generally show investors view private equity and private markets in a positive light, and they also show a market that is developing rapidly. Let's start our run through of the findings with a review of allocations and performance. The chart on the left shows a snapshot of LP's plans for their allocations to alternative assets over the next 12 months. Half of LPs plan to increase their target allocations to alternative assets over this period, with infrastructure, real estate, private equity, and private credit, all seeing significant proportions of LPs planning to increase target allocations. In fact, this is the highest number of LPs planning to add to alternatives since a barometer of summer 2007. The only asset type going against this trend is hedge funds, with LPs planned reductions in their target allocation echoing the picture in many previous barometers. Turning to performance, the chart on the right shows a proportion of LPs reporting net annual returns of over 16% and between 11 to 15% across their PE portfolios over time. The percentage of LPs who now report net annual returns of over 16% across the lifetime of their private equity portfolios, which is 42%, has been exceeded only once since the barometer was first published in 2004. And that was in 2007, in the run-up to the global financial crisis, when 45% of LPs reported the same. Valuations, when the survey was completed, would have likely been based on December 2021 figures at the latest. Given volatility in markets and the lag in valuations feeding through to performance, there will probably be some change to the reported figures in the coming quarters. Only time will tell if this was a turning point in the cycle. Continuing to look at the long-term picture, the barometer shows outperformance of LP's private equity portfolios over their public market ones for the majority of LPs. Over 70% of LPs report that their private equity portfolios have outperformed their public equity holdings since the global financial crisis. Only 14% of LPs reported the opposite. This corresponds with research from Cambridge Associates, which in 2021 reported that LPs with a private equity investment allocation of at least 30% outperformed those LPs with an allocation of 10% or less by 200 basis points. And most LPs are confident of hitting their private equity returns with only median fund performance. According to the barometer results, two thirds of limited partners would achieve their private equity return targets if all their funds achieved only the median performance for their fund cohort and their respective vintage years. And the figure is much higher for Asian Pacific LPs, as you can see in the chart. In this barometer, we also focused on risks. As we have seen so far, investing in private equity is a popular strategy among institutional investors. But in recent years, we have also seen other types of private equity investors investing in PE. This started with ultra and high net worth individuals accessing the market, and the asset class is now opening up to retail investors. According to BCG and iCapital, individual investors are forecast to make up over a tenth of the private equity fund market by 2025. So we asked LPs whether they viewed non-institutional sources of capital coming into private equity markets as a risk, and their answers were very different for returns and access. 
Almost two thirds of LPs believe that alternative sources of capital for private equity funds will present a long-term risk to institutional investors' private equity returns. However, only 30% of LPs believe these alternative sources of capital will create fund access risks for them. Any concern over risks is certainly not dampening investors' appetite for PE, with over half of LPs increasing their target allocations over the last two years, and only 10% of LPs reducing their allocations over the same period. According to Private Equity Wire, this will continue with the forecast of PE to account for nearly 70% of alternative assets AUM by 2025. This enthusiasm for investing in private equity funds doesn't prevent GPs from having to offer incentives to attract LPs into a first close of a fund, especially at a time such as now, when we see so many GPs coming back to the market in quick succession. In fact, almost all investors reported that they would commit to the first close of a fund as a result of an incentive offered by the GP, such as an early bird discount. With strong competition for allocations, 80% of LPs responded that an incentive would lead them to commit to a fund's first close, with fewer LPs citing committing because it was convenient for their workload scheduling. In the barometer, we like to spot and follow up on developing trends in the private capital industry. One such trend we reported back in the summer of 2018 was investors' appetite for investing in funds that purchase stakes in GP management companies. The strategy gives the fund investor access to the regular fee stream of the GP. For the GP itself, it can provide an injection of capital to use for platform development, for example. Back in 2018, around a third of LPs were investing in the strategy or planning to invest. This has now risen to nearly half of investors. Next, we turn to ESG, an area within private equity that has been developing rapidly in recent years. First, we looked at the big picture to gauge how investors viewed ESG as a potential driver of value from their personal perspective. It is pleasing to see that a majority of respondents in all surveyed regions of the world believe that ESG adds value, both through proactive change to portfolio companies and through the exclusion of high-risk investments and business practices. We then drilled down to ESG risks by looking at sector and industry exclusions. European LPs exclude more industries and sectors than respondents elsewhere, with two-thirds of European LPs having increased the number of sectors that their organizations exclude from investment consideration for ESG reasons in the last five years, compared to only a quarter of LPs in North America and Asia Pacific. Over four-fifths of LPs reported they currently exclude or plan to exclude weapons and or weapon components from their investment considerations. And over half of LPs exclude entities in systemic violation of the UN Global Compact principles. Beyond that, there were regional differences between European and North American LPs, with more European LPs likely to exclude thermal coal, non-sustainable deforestation, tobacco, alcohol, and gambling. I'll now hand over to Mike to present the rest of the findings. Thank you, Lauren. And hello, everyone. Picking up where Lauren left off, one area of potential risk for an LP is reputational damage, which can occur from being an investor in private equity funds. I'll give a couple of examples before looking at the findings. There are times in the life cycle of portfolio company ownership when private equity owners may have to make difficult decisions, such as reducing headcount. Often, this type of organizational change can create negative media headlines and not take the long-term outlook for the firm into consideration. Another example would be an LP invested in a GP that in turn invests in an industry which could have a negative impact on the climate. Such an investment could attract lobbying from climate activists, and as we saw on the previous slide, is likely to be one of the reasons why many LPs exclude these sectors from their investments. The barometer findings show that it's more the publicly exposed LPs that see a risk of reputational damage from their links to PE-owned businesses. In fact, over half of public pension plans, foundations, and endowments see a growing risk to their reputations from commentators or activists focused on LP links to private equity-owned businesses. Other investors who see themselves as less publicly exposed 
are not as concerned. Talking about climate change is seen as a universal environmental concern for LPs. Unsurprisingly, climate change is by far the most important environmental focus of investors' ESG programs, with 93% of LPs reporting that they focus strongly on this risk. European investors are more focused on individual ESG risks than their peers in North America and Asian Pacific regions, with specific concerns around biodiversity and deforestation. Conversely, Asia Pacific investors are more focused on air quality than their peers in other regions. One way of measuring a portfolio's impact on the environment is to adopt science based targets, and in particular, to adopt Science Based Target Initiative, or SBTI as it's known. So far, only 4% of LPs have asked their GPs to adopt the SBTI to measure and report portfolios' environmental impacts. However, many investors say that they are likely to make this request in the next few years, so adoption will certainly be on GPs' minds. Now let's switch gears and take a look at some new niche areas of investment opportunities for LPs, starting with crypto. Global venture capital investing in cryptocurrency and blockchain has grown rapidly in recent years, surpassing $9 billion in the first quarter of 2022, according to CB Insights. And it certainly seems that LP's view of crypto-enabled businesses as a legitimate investment focus. Almost a third of LPs currently have commitments to private equity and venture capital funds targeting investments in crypto-enabled businesses, and an additional 13% of private equity investors expect to make such commitments in the next few years. Fewer investors are committing to private equity and venture capital funds that invest using cryptocurrencies. 14% of LPs currently make commitments to such funds, and another 5% plan to do so in the next few years. However, the large majority of LPs do not see themselves ever investing in cryptocurrency funds including 44% of our survey respondents who have made a policy decision to exclude cryptocurrency investing. Another niche investment opportunity attracting interest from LPs is the metaverse. For those of you that have yet to experience the metaverse, it's a virtual reality space in which users can interact with a computer-generated environment and other users. We've pictured an example here of how an investment meeting could happen in the metaverse. According to Morgan Stanley, the monetization of this virtual world is likely to first come through advertising and e-commerce before developing into a new state where avatars buy and furnish their virtual homes using fungible tokens. LPs are switched on to this opportunity, with 17% currently making commitments to private equity and venture capital funds that target investments in services and goods for the metaverse and an equal proportion of limited partners planning to make such commitments in the next few years. While we are looking at growing areas of the market, let's take a look at the S in ESG and how LPs view the opportunity to support minorities within private equity and venture capital. According to PitchBook, in 2021, companies founded solely by women only garnered 2.3% of the total capital invested in venture-backed startups in the United States. But this looks set to change, with investors keen to invest in these businesses through venture capital firms. This is more so for North American LPs, with well over half having made or expecting to make commitments to venture capital funds that invest significantly or exclusively in businesses with female or ethnic minority founders. Around one-third of European and Asia-Pacific LPs make or expect to make such commitments. Next, we turn to staffing in LPs' organizations. With tight labor markets around the world and growing private capital markets leading to competition for talent, not only with other LPs, but also with GPs and advisors, it's no surprise to see that LPs feel that hiring high-quality investment staff has become more difficult. 51% of North American LPs and 45% of Asia-Pacific LPs say it has become more difficult to hire high-quality investment staff for their institutions than it was two years ago. One-third of European LPs agree. So what are LPs doing to attract more talent? Nearly half of LPs' institutions in North America and Europe 
are having to adjust their pay scales and or working conditions to attract new recruits in today's competitive market. And this proportion rises to over 60% for Asia Pacific LPs. We're seeing a mixture of approaches to attract talent, for example, from improving compensation packages to offering flexible working. But one area that is unlikely to change among working conditions, according to LPs, is the dress code as people return to the office rather than working from home. Just two in five LPs expect formal business clothing to disappear from the private equity world in the wake of the pandemic, and only half of investors would be happy if it did. Our last topic is private credit. And with the current economic backdrop of rising inflation and rising interest rates, we can see some churn in investors' private credit allocations. 35% of LPs have increased their target allocations to private credit over the last two years, and 19% of LPs have decreased allocations. A different picture to the results we reported earlier in the presentation when we asked LPs the same question on their private equity allocations, where the balance was more so in favor of increasing. And when looking forward, there is another clear distinction in how LPs view the private credit markets globally. Although the view is quite balanced for more developed markets, with more than half of investors seeing attractive opportunities in private credit funds targeting North America and Europe in the next two years, only one third of LPs see Asia Pacific focused funds in a similar way. Still, with that economic outlook in mind, we asked LPs for their views on default rates in private credit portfolios, and the results show a regional difference. One third of North American LPs foresee higher default rates in their private credit portfolios as a result of rising interest rates, compared to only one fifth of European LPs that expect the same. Time will tell if these concerns become a reality as we move through volatile markets. That concludes our findings. In this barometer, investors are telling us the number of LPs reporting annual net private equity returns over 16% is near record highs. LPs view ESG as a value driver for individual portfolio companies. LPs are having to change their pay and working conditions to attract talent. And some LPs have concern over possible higher default rates in their private credit portfolios as interest rates rise. We will circulate this presentation tomorrow by email. Alternatively, please feel free to reach out to any of the Collar team and we will arrange to send you a copy. The Barometer is a publication of the Collar Research Institute. You can find more information about our reports on the research section of the Collar Capital website. There is also an option to subscribe to our research for future publications. That concludes our presentation. For those of you that have submitted questions, we will follow up shortly. Thank you very much for watching.